Hi, this is uh, Joe Fredenzi, and uh, I'm going to be showing the program that I gave uh, on the evening of Greater Cities uh, 100th anniversary gala dinner, which was held on October the 7th of 2022. And uh, before I start the program, um, just a little background. Um, uh, Greater City was founded in 1922, um, and I became a member in 1984, and I was president of the society for 19 years. And during those 19 years and more, uh, I got to know many of the old timers from the club. I started collecting archival materials and all kinds of memorabilia that had to do with Greater City. Um, so I'm indebted to all those people uh, because without the archives they gave me and all the memorabilia, I wouldn't be able to tell this story. Um, the other thing I want you to be cognizant of is that, you know, I'm trying to, I want to keep this presentation to under an hour. And naturally, when you do that and you're talking about a span of a hundred years, you're going to leave some stuff out and you're going to leave some people out. You just can't do it all. You can't cover it, uh, you know, the way uh, I'd like to. Uh, because uh, it would just be a very, very long program. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the things that I find are of interest about the history of Greater City. It's really a remarkable history uh, and it, because it's a remarkable club, really. Um, and when I became involved in it, especially as the president, I, I regarded it as a big responsibility on my part to keep this club going and going strong. Um, and um, I, uh, I hope you enjoy the program. Um, all right, so um, this slide, for example, I want you to know is uh, thanks to my, my friend, Jason Kerner, who's a whiz at all things with computers and he made this beautiful first slide. Uh, the rest of the slides are photographs that I took and I, I'm afraid to say I'm a lousy photographer. And uh, so some of the photographs are not of exceptional quality, but again, they're just here to illustrate, uh, you know, my discussion of our history. So bear with me on that. Okay, so here's a souvenir book. It says, eighth annual exhibition of the Ridgewood Aquarium Society. And it's dated uh, from uh, 1924. Look at that. Okay, they were having their show at the uh, Brooklyn Labor Lyceum in Brooklyn. And uh, now uh, maybe at this point you're starting to say, uh, wait a second, Joe, uh, I, thought, uh, I, thought, I thought this program was about greater city why are you showing us a booklet from the Ridgewood Aquarium Society? Well, there's a reason. Um, what, what a lot of people don't know is that the Ridgewood Aquarium Society is what gave birth to, to the Greater City Aquarium Society. And, and I'll explain how shortly. Um, but... Um, Here's what you have to bear in mind. Back in the 1920s, there was a proliferation of aquarium societies all over the United States and certainly in New York City. The hobby was gaining uh, popularity every year. It, it was tremendously popular. And a lot of the societies were very localized. They, uh, they were named after a particular locality. And in this case, they were named after Ridgewood, which is a neighborhood in Queens County, which in 1924 was part of New York City. And Ridgewood uh, is a border area 
It's in Southern Queens and it sits on the border of Northern Brooklyn. And that's why, even though it's called the Ridgewood Aquarium Society, I am not at all surprised that they were held, held holding an event in Brooklyn. So, and this ties in to uh, the history of Greater City, as you'll see shortly in sig some significant ways. Um, so the, um, the um, point is that the Ridgewood Aquarium Society was a very active aquarium society, as you can tell from this uh, 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 show brochure, okay? And here's an example of the magazine they published. They, don't, they only published this magazine for a few years, but this one, as you can see, is dated um, October um, 1921. Um, and it was a nice magazine in its day. This happens to be a photocopy of a cover. So the photocopy is not very good. Uh, these issues, of course, are extremely rare. Um, and um, you could see they even had a price on it, 15 cents. And uh, as was the style in those days, they, they had the same border every, every issue. And then they would have a, a changing center and the date, of course. But the, the point that I'm making about this is that they were a very active aquarium society but there was one problem and um that problem well it was a problem for some people had to do with the nature of its uh membership now as i said ridgewood was this area in queens county uh that also besides bordering on brooklyn happened to have in the 20s a large, large influx of German immigrants. And um, this page is from that uh, 1924 show booklet. And uh, if you were to look at uh, the names on the list here, I, I think you would find that a large portion of the names, in fact, probably an overwhelming majority are German, certainly German surnames of all kinds. And what happened after a while was that um, the membership was so uh, made up of German immigrants that the meetings, a large part of the meetings were conducted in German and they would have German speakers who spoke German. And, and, you know, and it's understandable, you know, the, the German community heavily involved in the aquarium hobby. Uh, if you look at the early magazines, many of the authors were of German descent. Uh, aquarium Hamburg was probably the most Im important and famous aquarium company in its day. I mean, Germany was just well known for being, you know, a cradle of the aquarium hobby. So, and it's obvious that, you know, this, this uh, influx of German immigrants is undoubtedly what helped make the Ridgewood Aquarium Society a powerhouse in its day. But unfortunately, this presented a problem for some people uh, in, who didn't speak German. <laughs> and after a while, uh, a number of people who were previously members of the Ridgewood Aquarium Society, decided to start their own aquarium society uh, where the predominant language would be English. And uh, so that's what gave birth to the Greater City Aquarium Society. Now, uh, as you can see from this very early, um, this, this uh, sh uh, bowl show ribbon, as you can see, it says monthly exhibit. The club met in Brooklyn in those days, in the 20s and 30s. And that's easily understood because, as I've explained, the early members came from the Ridgewood Aquarium Society, which was a neighborhood that bordered Brooklyn. Um, 
so uh, that location is very understandable that they were, you know, located in Brooklyn. What you might not understand is, well, why did they call themselves the Greater City Aquarium Society? Well, I, I think there's two reasons behind that, why that name was chosen. One uh, seems to be that they wanted an aquarium society that was kind of co more cosmopolitan in scope. They didn't want it limited to one particular neighborhood in New York City. Um, the other reason is uh, that, you know, the club was founded in 1922, right? Okay, well, in 1898, various boroughs like Queens and Brooklyn and Manhattan and Staten Island, they combined at the time to make one big city out of New York because previously New York City only consisted of Manhattan. So they, when they combined all these boroughs or cities in 1898 to differentiate it from the previous New York City, they often refer to it in the publications, the newspapers as the greater city of New York. And so I guess when they decided to start this club in 1922, that moniker being of recent vintage was in their minds. And they said, okay, why don't we call it the Greater City Aquarium Society? And they did this, you know, there was in Manhattan, another aquarium society called the New York Aquarium Society, which was the oldest aquarium society in the United States at the time, having been founded around, I want to say 1894, something like that. And, um, so they couldn't call themselves the New York Aquarium Society because that already existed. So this is the name they chose, the Greater City Aquarium Society. And here's one of their early uh, uh, show journal covers. Uh, this one happens to be from 1932. And you can see it's, it's a very professionally done uh, journal, very artistic, I mean, that, in no fashion looks like a real angelfish, but you have to admit it's very artistic looking. And as you can see, the show was being held at the Highland Park branch of the Young Men's Christian Association on Jamaica Avenue in Brooklyn. And uh, that uh, building that houses the YMCA at Highland Park is still there. It's still there. Uh, Highland Park happens to be right on the border of Queens County and Brooklyn. It happens to be right, you know, which again makes sense that Greater City in the beginning met in a border area between Queens and Brooklyn, just like the Ridgewood Aquarium Society. And uh, the club met in Brooklyn for many years. Um, at the YMCA. Uh, you can see they had meetings um, and exhibitions and everything there. Here's an exhibition um, from 1933, uh, the same as that uh, uh, journal we just saw. Um, and, uh, you know, here they had a fancy ticket and uh, inviting people, members of the public, uh, to attend. Um, and look at the show schedule. It ran for four days from Friday through Monday. And look at those hours, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the show ran from one o'clock to 10 p.m. And that's incredible. <laughs> Try, imagine trying to get members to, to man a show until 10 o'clock at night, three nights in a row. And then on the Monday, which would have been the last day of the show, they, they shut down at six o'clock in the evening. Um, but, you know, shows were big then. The 1930s were a real heyday for the aquarium hobby in America. It was immensely popular. Um, and uh, just 
give you an example. Here's a New York Times front page from Sunday, August 29th, 1937. And look on the right hand side. It says new fish overshadows guppies to win prize at tropical show. Neon tetras like the sign of their name get highest award in first appearance here. Well, when you read the rest of the article, you come to learn that they were uh, reporting on this uh, because it turned the Greater City Aquarium Society was the first club to put a neon tetra on display in New York City. And you have to imagine what it was like back then. There wasn't a lot of color photography. Uh, if you wanted to see a, a neon tetra, which back then was the all the rage, because it had just been introduced into the hobby a few years earlier, and to see a live neon tetra, oh my God. I mean, no wonder it made the front page of the New York Times, okay? That's quite an achievement, because even in 1937, the New York Times was quite an important newspaper. And I dare say um, nowadays you'd be hard pressed to find any aquarium event that would make the front page of the New York Times. But Greater City was always at the forefront of the hobby in the 1930s, okay? Um, and uh, uh, this show was you know, attended by many, many people. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, my good friend, Gary Bagnall, the CEO of ZooMed and the founder of the Museum of Aquarium and Pet History, uh, I received a digital copy of our 1937 show journal. And then we made souvenir copies of it for all the people who attended our gala dinner back in October. Um, so it's, uh, quite, quite a nice thing to have as a souvenir. Um, and then of course, uh, the, uh, you know, as I said, the 1930s were huge, big, big activities in the aquarium hobby. And then unfortunately the war came and, uh, because of that, a lot of things slowed down or shut down altogether. And, uh, uh, but Greater City was kept alive. And uh, here's a, a notebook page from uh, March 3rd of 1946. And it's, it says preliminary meeting, uh, you know, at the home of so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, you know, for the reopening of the Greater City Aquarium Society for active duty. You know, of course, they were uh, using army terminology, which, you know, was all current back then. And uh, they it says this is the first post-war meeting of the society will be held on Wednesday, March the 13th at 8 p.m. And uh, you can see uh, Wednesday has always been the day that Greater City meets on. Currently, we meet on the first Wednesday of the month. And um, the, um, that's, you know, that's, I, I know from my research that you could go back as far as the 1920s and you will uh, see that we always met on a Wednesday. And then uh, about a year later, now they got a little fancier. They were typing up the minutes of, of the meetings. And uh, you could see here, uh, you know, it's December 10th, 1947. They're opening up the meeting at 845, which is pretty late by today's uh, standards because now currently our, we, we open our meetings at 730. And you can see the list of officers and the president was a guy named Mr. Whiteway. Whiteway. I mean, it's, it's like out of uh, Hollywood Central Casting, <laughs> having a president with the name of uh, Whiteway. And then you could see the meeting was turned over to Mr. Klaus, who delivered a very interesting talk on breeding neons and rasboras. So, I mean, my God. Um, 
anybody who could breed neons and resboras back then would have been uh, regarded as uh, the most uh, uh, successful, the, the most accomplished breeder of his day. Um, and uh, um, I've seen uh, in, you know, in the 60s, I saw an article written by this Mr. Klaus in, in one of Greater Cities magazines, in fact. So it's quite a coincidence. And, uh, and then it says the meeting adjourned at 10, 10 p.m. So uh, given that the meeting at it opened at 845, uh, it was qu qu uh, quite, quite a short meeting. They probably didn't have an auction like we do now. Every month we have a big auction, which takes up a lot of time. And it says meeting adjourned and refreshments were served. So uh, unlike what we do now, where we have refreshments throughout the meeting, um, the, um, the, uh, then what they would do is have the formal part of the meeting and then the refreshments would get served, you know? Uh, so um, it very, it's very interesting. Um, but that was 1947. And, you know, they, they had shows. Here are two ribbons uh, from the, you know, probably the 50s. Um, and um, you can see they, you know, they had a catfish class. And just as is the standard today, blue ribbon for first place. Second place is a red ribbon, and you see the logo there uh, of the angelfish, uh, which is, you know, Greater City's emblem. And uh, at the meetings, they had door prizes, just like we do now, except back then they printed up these fancy tickets, these custom-made tickets, unlike today where we use these generic ones that you buy at the, you know, 99 cent store. Uh, but somehow uh, one of these survived <laughs> and I have it to show you. Um, here uh, in 1955, for example, this is a, a page from TFH magazine and it talks about the Mineola State Fair and Mineola is a town in Nassau County, which borders Queens County. And you can see they're having a a uh, tropical fish exhibit at the famous Roosevelt Raceway, October 9th through October 17th. And uh, the, uh, the article talks about some of the uh, uh, goings on. It says, for example, the internationally famous Paul Hanel of the Bronx Aquarium Society won first prize. John Miller, Ozone Park, Long Island took second honors. Uh, both winners featured color and size to their to advantage, and they're talking about guppies there, because uh, for those of you who don't know, Paul Hanel was back in the 50s and the 60s, probably one of America's most famous guppy breeders. Not he wasn't probably, he was one of America's most famous guppy breeders. But who the person uh, that they name who took second, John Miller of Ozone Park. Now, Ozone Park, by the way, happens to be in Queens County, okay? John Miller was also a very well-known guppy breeder. And uh, so I'm not surprised that he took second place. Uh, John Miller um, had a son who also kept fish, as well as his grandson, Steve Miller. And Steve Miller the grandson of John is still a member, is a member of the Greater City Aquarium Society. Uh, eventually, uh, even Paul Hanel, who was from the Bronx, got uh, involved with the Greater City Aquarium Society and participated in a lot of its activities. But what, what this uh, event also illustrates to me is that Greater City really was kind of cosmopolitan in scope because in addition to meeting in Brooklyn and then uh, uh, other things, uh, it, it had a show in Nassau County, um, uh, which wasn't part of Queens or Brooklyn, you know? Um, so it, 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 it's, it's a precedent for 
other things that, you know, the club has done over the years. We've participated in events that have been held outside of Brooklyn and Queens County. And this, this is certainly a, a major illustration of that. Uh, and also in the 50s, uh, we started publishing this magazine called Modern Aquarium. And um, as you can see, it was a very, uh, you know, small little thing. And uh, it didn't have any photographs. It just had all these beautiful drawings and a beautiful layout, which were uh, largely due to the efforts of John Padovani. I don't know if you can make out his name in the lower right hand corner, but I, I got to know John Padovani and uh, he was by trade a commercial artist. And so he was able um, to make all these beautiful drawings and the masthead and everything for the club. Now, this magazine didn't last very long. Uh, we don't really know how many years it ran for because nobody has a complete collection of it, not even I, but it was around, I would say for around three or four years at least during the uh, late 1950s, from the mid to late 1950s. And uh, this becomes important because even though it didn't survive for very long, it gave us this name, Modern Aquarium. And, you know, again, because I, I knew all these old timers like John Padovani, I learned certain things that were never written down. For example, how they came up with the name Modern Aquarium. Um, the most popular magazine, Aquarium magazine in the 1950s was Innes's fabled The Aquarium magazine, which he had been publishing since 1932. And, um, some of the members, I guess, were sitting around. Again, this is according to John Padovani. And they decided, you know, we kind of need a more up-to-date magazine. That, that Innis magazine is getting a little stodgy, you know. At least that's what they thought. And they, so they said, hey, let's start our own magazine. And we'll call it Modern Aquarium. <laughs> and so that, that's how they came up with that title. And uh, now we go into the 60s, and here's an actual uh, cutout from a, a major newspaper heralding the first metropolitan New York tropical fish show and exhibit presented by Greater City Aquarium Society in conjunction with Gertz Pet Shop. Now, what you have to know, though, is that Gertz was not a pet shop, <laughs> it was a department store. It was Queens County's flagship uh, department store. You know, back then, every borough in New York City or county, whatever you want to call it, they each had their own flagship department stores. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, like the Bronx had Alexander's, uh, Brooklyn had Abraham and Strauss, Manhattan had Macy's and Gimbel's. Well, Queens had Gertz. So Gertz was a department store. Uh, and like all the department stores in those days, they really had a lot of departments. That's why they were called department stores. They didn't just sell clothing and shoes and, and homeware. They had a department for people who collected stamps. They had a coin collecting department. They had a photography department, on and on and on. And they all had pet departments. So, uh, Gertz, of course, had a pet shop and they had different branches, uh, but the major departments, uh, the major branch of Gertz was located in Jamaica, which was an area not too far from Ridgewood. OK, uh, and um, so we got to have this big show at the uh, Gertz department store. And here's an actual original black and white photograph that I have of the show, <clears throat> which was being held in 1968 uh, or 69. Um, and you can see all the tanks, all these two and a half gallon stainless steel tanks set up on high tables. <clears throat> and the gentleman in the center of the picture 
Unfortunately, I do not know who he, who he is, but I know he's a member because when you look closely at the picture, you can see he's wearing a show badge on his uh, um, uh, on his pocket there, on his shirt pocket. The other people, I'm sure, were just wandering through. I mean, that's one of the advantages of having, imagine having a show at a department store. Hundreds, if not thousands of people are going to come through and just out of curiosity, take a look at the show and generate tremendous publicity for it. And the reason we were able to have this show at the Gertz department store is because who do you think was the manager of the pet shop? Well, the manager of the pet shop was none other than the person I've previously mentioned, who was a famous guppy breeder, John Miller. J John Miller, who lived in Ozone Park, which is near Jamaica also. Um, so he's the one that facilitated this. Uh, I mean, nowadays, I can't even imagine a department store giving anybody permission to hold a fish show their uh, liability lawyers would uh, chop their heads off because of all the risk involved from lawsuits, from people slipping on water and God knows what else. But anyway, this original photo then made it into the January 1968 issue of uh, Tropical Fish Hobbyist Magazine. Um, and uh, so now I... I want to correct something I said earlier. I said the show was either 68 or 69. It was 67, actually, from 1967. And um, so uh, this, this gentleman who then became a very important member of uh, Greater City by the name of Dan Carson, he wrote this article called My First Show. And so in the January 1968 issue, we got a tremendous amount of publicity in this very well-written article, which gives you all the details uh, about the show. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's great. It, it's a great historical document. And um, I'm so happy that Dan Carson took the time to write this, but you could see the photo they used is exactly the one that I have in my collection um, that was uh, given to me by Gene Bioko, who I have more to tell you about him later. And uh, here you could see a close-up um, of uh, this gentleman who's handing this young boy uh, a prize is uh, Charles Elzer, who was the president at the time. And behind uh, Charles Elzer, uh, you can see a partial view of a banner. And, and that's the Greater City Aquarium Society banner uh, which we still have to this day. We still have that banner. Uh, we put it on display at the gala dinner. We bring it to every meeting. It's on display. Uh, and it's amazing how what great condition it's still in uh, these uh, 60 plus years later. Um, so, but this photo also illustrates that, you know, even in, in you know, when it's in its heyday, because again, the the hobby was very popular in the 60s. We tried to encourage young people to participate. And uh, you could see if you scan the crowd, you could you could see people wearing sunglasses and they look rather young to me. So we we drew, you know, relatively young people back then uh, to our shows and, and everything. And and that's certainly a good thing. And here's another uh, photo from that same show. And uh, the gentleman on the left is Gene Bioko. Uh, and Gene had been a member of the club since the 1950s. So this is 67. And he had been a member since the, the 1950s. In fact, in the 1950s, he served six consecutive terms as president, which at that time was unheard of. Uh, most presidents served one or two terms at most to the most. No one had ever served more than two until Gene came along and he served for six years. And then he was the show chairman of this show and also many other shows. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> he's one of the gentlemen who I got to know 
when I joined the club, um, uh, in a coincidence, Gene was born in 1922, the same year that our club was founded. <clears throat> and he passed away, unfortunately, in 1999 at the relatively young age of 77. But <clears throat> in the time that he, I was in the club, I got to know him pretty well. And he's the gentleman that really saved a lot of our archives, uh, saved a lot of things that we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and because of all the things that he did for the club and his devotion to it, you know, every year, Greater City gives out an award. We call, it's called the Aquarist of the Year Award. But um, after Gene's passing, we named it in his honor. So now it's known as the Gene Bioko Aquarist of the Year Award. And look at those trophies. Look at that silver, boy. That's beautiful. I mean, those are gorgeous trophies. I wish I had one of those. I, I wish we, I'd, I'd be able to find them. I'd love to see what it look, they look like in, in, you know, in the flesh. And then the other thing that happened in the 60s, right after this show uh, in 67, is we started republishing Modern Aquarium. Here's one of the very first issues. In fact, I think this is volume one, number one, November, dated November 1968. And now you can see a dramatic difference between this and the earlier version of Modern Aquarium. Uh, although this is a small sized uh, magazine as, as was the custom back then, you know, TFH, Tropical Fish Hobbyist, and uh, was about this size. Uh, we had a beautiful black and white photo on the cover. Uh, and this is an original photo. Uh, we had a, a photographer in the club who took all these amazing photos. And so even on the inside, you have black and white photography. And um, they're, they're amazing. Uh, there are so many important articles about people in the hobby back then that it makes Modern Aquarium, this particular series that went from 1968 to December 1974, an extremely important periodical. If you want to know about the hobby in the 60s, especially about the hobby in New York City. And, uh, and uh, for example, here's a cover from October 1969. And here's the already mentioned famous guppy breeder, Paul Hanel, who, who was German. He was born in Germany. And here he is. Here's a photograph of him at one of our shows, looking over the entries. Again, you can see they're in these two and a half gallon stainless steel tanks. I still have one or two, believe it or not, of these stainless steel tanks that were used in the show. And you know that they're show tanks because on the bottom, which is made out of slate, uh, it's painted in black, the letters GCAS. Um, anyway, uh, one of the ironies of this cover is that um, the month before it was published, Paul Hanel passed away, um, sadly. But by then, he had already established himself as a world, one of the world's leading guppy breeders. He had become very involved with Greater City and was made an honorary member. Um, and uh, this is just one of the many ways that uh, Modern Aquarium documented the people and the events of those years. Um, here's a souvenir journal from 1972 uh, when we were celebrating our 50th anniversary. Uh, you can see this uh, beautiful logo that was designed in uh, 1969, again, featuring an angelfish. And uh, it was our 50th anniversary. <laughs> and that was quite a milestone, you know, back then to be celebrating 50 years. Um, and here's the show judges that are listed in that show journal. And this, for anybody who knows anything about the hobby in the New York metropolitan area, this list of show judges was virtually a who's who of famous fish breeders, okay? Gene Bioko, John Miller, who I've already mentioned, Louis Rexford, another big guppy breeder, George Torres, who was from the Bronx, 
I think George was famous for many things, but maybe betters, I want to say. Charles Elzer, who I've already mentioned, who was the president of the club for a couple of years, and probably America's, you know, most famous breeder, Rosario Lacourt. Um, and Rosario, I'm happy to say, is still with us. He's he's 93 years old. And uh, while he doesn't breed fish anymore, um, he's still very involved. I talk to him every week. Um, and uh, you'll see how he ties in to more greater city history later on. Um, and uh, Warren Young was also another famous breeder in his day. And here, I, through serendipity, I met a man who actually had an entry in our 1972 show, and he took first prize, and here's the trophy. OK, and you can see it's got the number 50 on it, the date and uh, got a guppy on top. And below the 50 is an enamel pin, a blue enamel pin with our angelfish logo. We still make those pins. OK, so I know now I know from having this trophy that those pins have been in use since at least the early 1970s. And. You know, that just cements the idea that you have to know this about Greater City is we treasure our past. We continue a lot of the traditions that we had in the past while trying to, you know, keep up with modern times and everything. But, you know, we're very much into honoring our past. And, and this is an example of that. Uh, and here in 1980, we have another show at the uh, Green Acre Shopping Center in Valley Stream. Now, Valley Stream, again, is not in Queens County. It's not in Brooklyn. It's in Nassau County. Uh, and yet, there we were. We were having a show there at the, this big shopping center. And, you know, I, as, I'm pretty familiar with the history of clubs that have existed in New York City. And I, I feel comfortable saying, uh, without fear of contradiction, that Greater City is the only club that has had meetings and has had you know, its headquarters in two different counties, first in Brooklyn and then um, in Queens County. Um, so, you know, it, it's just an amazing thing. And by 1980, uh, we started meeting, this 1980 was the first year that we started meeting at our present uh, meeting place, our, you know, the Queens Botanical Garden in Flushing, which is a section of Queens County. And uh, we've been meeting at the same place, the Queens Botanical Garden, since 1980. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very happy there. Now, between 1980 and 1992, for whatever reason, we didn't have any shows. When our 70th anniversary came around, uh, the club decided it was time. You know, you're going to have you having a special commemoration, 70 years, nothing to sneeze at. Let's have a show. So here we are. This is inside the main building at the Queens Botanical Garden where we held our monthly meetings and look at all that hardware. <laughs> and yes, that's that's me in the photo. I was a lot skinnier then. And um, uh, and here we have all the show class trophies and the best to show trophy and everything. And each trophy is topped by an angel fish. Uh, again, that's our logo. And you know, shows are important. Uh, here, you know, we, we stopped using the stainless steel tanks, which were very hard to store and carry. And we, we got plastic tanks from the Lustar company in, in New Jersey. And uh, the gentleman with his finger pointing at one of the entries is a, is a guy named Warren Foyer, who got involved in the club right around that time. And he became the first editor of the third series of Modern Aquarium, because the second series, as I've already said, 
ceased publication in 1974. So from 1974 to 1994, the club did not publish a magazine. They they had newsletters. We had you know a newsletter, but not a magazine. And Warren is the guy who became the first editor of Modern Aquarium Series 3. But it shows you that shows are important because you get people like this that come out. I mean, this is this is my good friend, Basil Holobus. Now, Basil does not live in Queens, has never lived in Queens or Brooklyn. And he lives on the other side of Long Island Sound. And uh, he came to the show and he's been involved with the club ever since. And he's a great guy and a great breeder. Same thing with Mark Soberman. Uh, of course, he doesn't look like this anymore. This, this is, you know, 1992. Uh, but, you know, he became um, uh, 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 one of our board members. He served as vice president for a number of years. He became an expert on catfish. He's very well known in, in the catfish world. And you could see there's a, a stained glass window. Someone's holding a stained glass window, right? You see that? Well, that stained glass window was made, was handmade uh, as a, a raffle prize at the 1992 show. And it's just beautiful. In fact, it was so beautiful. I bought so many raffle tickets. I can't even begin to tell you. I easily spent $100 on raffle tickets. But it paid off because guess who won that thing? I did. And to this day, it's hanging in my fish room. And it's a beautiful work of art. Uh, and it was made by, you see the person holding it? You know who that was? None other than Horst Gerber. Uh, Horst uh, was trained as a cabinet maker in Hamburg, Germany, where he was born. And um, he made that stained glass work. And it's magnificent. And Horst is right now, and he has been for a couple of years, he's been the president of Greater City. Which, of course, is very ironic that here we are celebrating our 100th year and uh, we have a German speaking president. <laughs> Pretty ironic when you consider that Greater City was formed because there were a bunch of people tired of hearing German. <laughs> so I think it's pretty funny. But Horst is uh, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. And um, we're very happy to have him as our president. Um, and uh, he's the one that made that beautiful stained glass window of an Epiplatus annulatus with a, uh, a plant, an Anubius plant in the background. Just gorgeous. And also at that 1992 show was my good buddy, Gene Bioko. And it just goes to show you that despite the fact that he had been involved in the club way back in the 1950s, here he is some 40 years later, still participating, still helping out the club, you know, either as a judge or as an advisor or whatever. Um, um, just a wonderful guy. And I'm so glad I got to know him. We used to go to shows together, uh, you know, in other places. It, and mind you, I mean, he was born in 1922. So he was old enough to be my father. Okay. But he, he never, um, he, he never treated me like, you know, I didn't know anything or whatever. He was just a good friend. And then, as I said, here we go. Not in January of 1994 with Warren as the editor, we come out with this first issue of Modern Aquarium. And you can see it's a beautiful, striking cover. Uh, we were lucky at the time that we had a, a, a member, a very active member, who was also a commercial artist at one time, just like John Padovani had been. And his name was Stefan Zander. And he's the one that came up with his design. And I was like flabbergasted, like, wow, beautiful. So every month the insert would be changed. And back then we didn't have the computer capability we have now. so. Each of these photograph, uh, photographs would be printed on a page, like a number of them, like, I don't know, eight or so or six on a page. And then they would be hand cut and hand pasted to the cover. And the cover was made from very heavy stock. And for the first issue 
on the cover, we had a, a photograph of a fish that was then known as Cyclosoma hadiensis. And this is a breeding female. And this was my fish. And uh, at the time that I bred this fish, it was the first known instance of this fish ever being bred in captivity in the United States. Um, so it, it was it made for a very striking cover. And uh, here's the the you know the title page or whatever you want to call it of the first one, volume one, number one. And you can see right from the beginning we called it series three. All right. Uh, and so it was a modest uh, number of pages. I mean, it was about 13 pages, 14 pages, something like that. But it was the beginning of a great magazine. Um, since its inception, we've done a lot of things with this magazine. Um, uh, after Warren was the editor for about four years, uh, our next editor was a guy named Al Priest, who's still a member. And Al was very inventive with coming up with specialty issues and themes. And one of the themes that he came up with, which was one of my favorites, was we had a, an issue that was just articles by women, women either who were members or women who were the spouses of members. And so uh, this was a very fun issue. It even got my wife to write in, uh, an article. <laughs> the First Lady of Fish by Anita Fredenzi, okay? Uh, but uh, the, the other thing that's amazing, you know, about this magazine, and, you know, besides uh, uh, all, all these special issues that we did, oops, excuse me, uh, is that uh, uh, we got to put color photographs in after a while, beautiful drawings, lots of articles about people, about the club, about everything that went on. Uh, it's a fantastic magazine. So that's how it all began in 1994. And then in 1997, we had our, our Diamond Jubilee show, 75 years, okay? We'd had a couple of shows in between, you know, in between 92 and 97, but this one was a really special show. Um, and you can see this, this is our souvenir show journal. It's got a border that came from an old a magazine from the 1930s. And uh, we, um, we had this show at a hotel near LaGuardia Airport. I believe it was a Marriott. And uh, again, shows are very important because you get all kinds of people turning out for a show that you might not get at a meeting. For example, well, this isn't an example of that, but this first photograph, that's me holding a trophy with Gene Bioko on, my, on the left there. And he's helping me present this trophy. And again, this is 1997. He's still involved with the club. He still comes to the shows. He still comes to the meetings. You can see I'm wearing the special Diamond Jubilee uh, sweatshirt we designed because you can see the diamond right there on my sleeve. And uh, this is, like I said, 97. And unfortunately, Gene wouldn't be with us two years later. So, you know, always do what you can in the present and, and get to know these old timers because they're not going to be around forever. And here's uh, me presenting a trophy to on the extreme left, Sue Priest, and that's Al Priest. We're all wearing the same design shirt. And Al Priest is the guy who became the editor of Modern Aquarium for many years, over 10 years. And he really ratcheted up all the, the standards that we have for that magazine. Uh, during during uh, his tenure, oh my God, the magazine won so many awards, I lost count, uh, either from the Federation of American Aquarium Societies or the Northeast Council of Aquarium Societies. Every year, we won, you know, every prize imaginable um, because we had great writers and we were able to put together a really beautiful magazine. And here's another person who became very important to our club. And this was her first appearance. Somehow she found out that we were having a show and she drove 
all the way from Montauk, Long Island, out to LaGuardia Airport, where we were having the show. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, familiar with Long Island geography, uh, Montauk is as far out on Long Island as you can get. And you go any further and you're in the Atlantic Ocean or uh, on the other side is Rhode Island and Massachusetts, okay? Yet she drove all the way from there just to come to our show. And I'll never forget seeing her for the first time. I didn't know who she was. I was saying to myself, who is this uh, woman? <laughs> she was very shy uh, at first, but we eventually drew her in and uh, uh, she became a very important member of our club um, in many different ways, which I'll explain later. But again, you see, if you don't have shows, if you don't have events, you won't find new people, new talented people like this. And how about this photo? Oh, well, this is one of my favorite photos because the gentleman with the sunglasses is named Carl Kaplan. Now, Carl, was the cousin of famous aquarist Ross Sokoloff. Some of you may have heard the name, maybe some of you have not, but Ross Sokoloff was a very, very famous hobbyist. He's got a, a fish from uh, Lake Malawi named after him. Uh, I think it's called Pseudotrophia Solo Sokoloffi. Uh, he was involved in the aquarium trade for many years, great guy. I, I got to meet him on a number of occasions, but Carl was his cousin, his slightly older cousin. Carl lived in Manhattan at the time that I met him, which was this show. And the reason Carl was at our show in 1997 is because he had given us this. You see this? This is a Greater City Medal from 1932. You can see the date embossed on the medal. And how did Carl Kaplan have this medal? Well, because when he was a young man, he entered our show in 1932 and won this gold medal, first place gold medal. Now, could you imagine the thrill it was for me and everybody else to meet a gentleman in 1997 who was at your show in 1932? Just let that roll around in your head for a while, okay? 1932. Most of the people listening to this program weren't even alive in 1932, all right? And so for me to meet him was a thrill. He was a real gentleman. Uh, he gave us that medal for our uh, collection of memorabilia. Uh, we presented him with a beautiful framed certificate of appreciation. And I asked him to help me present the best of show trophy, which is what he's doing here now. But this illustrates the continuity of our club and the respect we have uh, for all the people who came before us. It's just fantastic to have this medal. For our, uh, our 2002 and 2004 shows, we made replicas of this, of this medal for first, second, and third place in each class. I mean, the replicas are nice. They, they don't quite have the artistry of this, but um, you know, we did copy the angelfish with its very unusual, uh, you know, splayed out uh, ventral fins. You can see that. Um, and uh, you know, most of the time angelfish don't are not displayed with the ventral fins uh, out like that. They're usually folded back, but uh, art, the artist back in 1932, he, he did it this way. And it's, we still use this logo uh, in our magazine. We have a drawing of it and we use it all the time. And then, you know, in the 90s, uh, or actually maybe the early 2000s, um, Greater City started this program called CARES. Uh, conservation awareness and recognition of endangered species preservation program. And here's one of the first booklets that was put together um, uh, for this program. But who was the the brain, you know, the, the the brainstorm behind this was none other than Claudia Dickinson, who, as I said, first appeared on our on our screen at our 1997 show. 
Well, Claudia was a, a very enthusiastic hobbyist. She had a lot of great ideas. And one of them was to create this program. And of course, we were very supportive and very much behind it. And Claudia uh, worked tirelessly on this project to the point where the CARES program is now a standalone nationally recognized uh, enterprise. And uh, in 2019, Greater City won the inaugural Klaus Steinhaus Member Club of the Year Award, uh, as it says on the, on the plaque for being the first club to implement the CARES program. And of course, we're very proud of that fact, uh, not only of being the first, but we're very proud of the fact that it came from Claudia, who really got introduced to the aquarium hobby by being a member of our club. Um, the other things we've done more, more recently in, uh, we, we saved this sign. We helped save this sign of the, that used to hang out uh, uh, on the side of the store, outside the store known as the Aquarium Stock Company, which uh, was founded in 1910 in Manhattan in its heyday, which you know was the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, it was, I would say, without reservation, the most famous aquarium store in the United States. It was an entire block long, um, and this is in downtown Manhattan, mind you, it was an entire block long it's the place where I saw my first blue Galaris. They had everything under the sun. Uh, they got imported fish from Germany and all over. Um, and when it went out of business in around 1980 or so, uh, we always wondered what happened to this sign. Because I remembered this as a boy when I would go there by subway. They had this beautiful neon sign with an angel fish on it hanging over the street. Um, Fortunately, Gary Bagnall found the sign in the possession of some, some junk dealer in New Jersey. And uh, with, with the help of Greater City, uh, Gary negotiated with the guy and we got it for a somewhat reasonable price. It was still a lot, a lot of money, but it was well worth saving because this, this is part of the history of our hobby, okay? Uh, and Gary did all the work and paid all the expenses to have all the neon restored because the actual neon lighting had all been destroyed, okay? So credit to Gary for not only finding the sign, but then restoring it. And it's a vivid reminder of the heyday of the aquarium hobby. Uh, and since it related to New York City, uh, our club felt a special obligation to contribute to its purchase. And now, of course, it's on display at uh, the Museum of the Aquarium and Pet Hobby in uh, St. Louis Obispo, California. And we're, we're so thrilled and we're grateful, you know, that on the list of contributors uh, to the museum, you know, they have a website. I'm proud to say that the Greater City Aquarium Society is the only aquarium society listed as a contributor to this fabulous new museum that Gary opened just this year. And getting back to Claudia, and a little you know, later, 2007, uh, she wrote this book for the Animal Planet series that was published by uh, Tropical Fish Hobbyist, um, Aquarium Care of Cichlids. Claudia is a, a, a very important member of the American Cichlid Association. Uh, she was made a fellow of that club for all her contributions to that organization. Uh, but again, you know, her start in the aquarium hobby was with our club. And we're very proud that she authored this book. There aren't a lot of aquarium societies who can say that they <laughs> nurtured a member who went on to write a, a wonderful book like this. But uh, speaking of books, in 2018, uh, the Greater City Aquarium Society published this book, 
An Aquarius Journey by Rosario Lacourt. As I've said earlier, uh, Rosario Lacourt is without a doubt uh, the most famous aquarium fish breeder in the United States. Thank God he's still in good health, that I get to talk to him frequently. And as a result of a show we had back in 2008, I started talking to Rosario about writing his story because I would often see presentations by Rosario and they were peppered with all kinds of interesting stories about fish, where they came from, who was the first guy to get them, who was the first person to breed them, all kinds of interesting stories. And I convinced Rosario that unless he wrote down these stories, they would be lost to posterity. So beginning in 2008, Rosario would write a chapter a month, and we would publish that chapter in Modern Aquarium. And then when he was finished, and it took 10 years, uh, because it's, it's a pretty thick book and, it, and covers everything. When it was finally finished, we put it together in book form. We put all those chapters together in book form. We put in a, an index, all, all, a bibliography, all kinds of things. And then we made it available on uh, Amazon. So anyone who's interested in this spectacular book, you don't even have to be interested in tropical fish. I mean, I've had people tell me they love the book, even though they're not an aquarist. They, they don't care anything about for anything about tropical fish. But this book is just such a terrific autobiography that they enjoyed it anyway. And it's full of great photos because Rosario is a terrific photographer. And again, you see, this is a greater city besides saving the uh, aquarium stock company sign. We're saving the memories of important people in our hobby. And we're very, very proud of this book. And here's a more recent issue of Modern Aquarium, which we continue to publish. It's now in its 28th year of continuous publication. Now, now when I say continuous publication, I must point out something. This magazine has for 28 years been issued on the first Wednesday of every month, well, 10 months a year, you know, there are two months, like most aquarium societies, there are two months in every year when we don't meet, but 10 issues a year that come out on the first Wednesday of every month. And why does it have to come out on the first Wednesday of every month? Because that's when we have our meeting on the first Wednesday of every month. And we don't nail this to members. There's a lot of reasons why we don't mail this to members, but suffice it to say, the fact that it has to come out on the first Wednesday of every month without fail, and it has, is a testament to the members of our club. Uh, primarily, of course, it's editors, you know, starting with Warren Foyer, then handing it off to Al Priest. And for the last 10 years or so, it's been Dan Radabout. And think of the commitment that goes into this. There's no sloppiness allowed here. You, if it comes out a day late, the members don't get it. They ha they'd have to wait a whole month before they get the magazine, okay? And uh, in addition to this uh, unbelievable uh, 28 years of achievement, recently, um, you know, Dan has also put the magazine online. Uh, if you go to Greater Cities website, uh, you will find that you can click on Modern Aquarium and then see every year since 1994 and read every issue page by page. OK, it's amazing the archive we've created uh, about our hobby uh, through Modern Aquarium. Um, and, you know, you can see this issue features a beautiful a uh, reef tank. This is a killifish. Um, we, you know, we have beautiful covers. We have uh, talented writers, uh, some pretty good photographers, and it's, it's really an amazing thing that we continue to publish this magazine now, you know, 28 years uh, without fail every month that we meet. 
And so, you know, we get to this point, you know, it's our 100th anniversary. We, we designed a, a long sleeve t-shirt. This is the, the first time uh, Greater City has um, done a long sleeve t-shirt. We've done sweatshirts, we've done regular t-shirts. We even did a golf shirt for the first time a couple of years ago. And uh, you can see it's, it, this was created by our, our members, uh, Marsha Radabau and Jason Kerner. And you can see the logo, it's very stylish. You know, that's one thing about you, you look at any <laughs> greater city garment from the past, the designs are very stylish, okay? No, no junky stuff for us. And on the sleeve there, on the uh, left-hand sleeve, you can see it says 100th anniversary. And uh, here it is, here's the banner, you know, uh, which uh, was at the gala dinner and which uh, is in my possession and which I bring to every meeting. And, you know, it's amazing. Again, this ties in to, you know, the fact that we really respect our past and uh, look forward to the future. And yeah, this slide here, which Jason created, kind of speaks for itself. Well, thank you for listening. <laughs>